we as believers need to learn how to do discernment ministry properly. We need to look carefully at how investigative journalism is being done within the Christian church. Oftentimes, it's not investigative journalism. It's the yellow journalism practiced in the world imported into the church. So often, we are stuck in our own psycho-epistemological cocoons in a linguistic hall of mirrors. And we think some, how or other, we have been able to fully codify the mystery of the nature of God in our language and denounce those when cultural barriers are often the obstacle. We need, as Christians, to understand doctrine and theology. We need to know that theology matters. That what we are discussing in studio today is not an ivory tower debate. There are people halfway around the world sitting in prisons and dying because ideas have consequences. That's what we're talking about today, Elliot. That's exactly right, Hank. Uh, ideas do have consequences, and, and what we in the counter-cult community have published doing our thing of critiquing different movements according to a paradigm that we developed. Uh, you know, you fit into this paradigm, you're orthodox. You don't fit into it, then you're unorthodox. Uh, but not really thinking in terms of a larger paradigm that would match the entire human race, but more seeing things from the paradigm of our Western evangelical perspective. If we stamp heresy on a group and uh, because they failed our, our litmus test, we may not realize that, number one, that that was more of a culturally than theologically determined stamp, and number two, that the consequences of that is that our brothers and sisters in Christ, directly because of what we published, are being put in prison and persecuted, and some don't return alive. And, you know, this is not melodramatic speech. I met people when you and I were in China last year who had been in prison as a result of material that we and others had published. And they could not have been more gracious, but the Holy Spirit was gracious enough to let me see the consequences of our uh, past cavalier actions. I think it's really important, too, that as Christians we never uh, knowingly take someone out of context or distort what they say. And we as the Christian Research Institute have been doing primary research for many, many years. Our organization is celebrating our uh, Jubilee year this year, so we've been in existence for 50 years. Uh, we are responsible for what we say, and we're very responsible in what we do. And in 2003, we began a primary research project on uh, the local churches or the Lord's Recovery, as they're known, uh, because uh, it was possible, it seemed to us, that we had contributed to a fountainhead of misinformation with respect to the local churches. And in doing a six-year primary research project, that is exactly what we discovered. And so we had to have the the the, the Christian conduct of recognizing that when we have taken someone not completely in context, that we have to say we are wrong, and that's exactly what we did.
Elliot Miller points out that in 1985, Gordon Melton, founder of the Institute for the Study of American Religions, published an open letter himself concerning the local churches, Witness Lee, and the Godmen controversy, a controversy over a book titled The Godmen. And he writes, during the past year, I, like many of you, have become concerned about the lawsuit between the local church led by Witness Lee and Spiritual Counterfeits Project and the publisher of their book, The Godmen. I was at first concerned that a Christian body, like the local church, would take fellow Christians to court until I discovered that the leaders in the church had exhausted all less severe means to have the book withdrawn and its errors acknowledged. Recently, I was asked by the local church to begin a more rigorous investigation of its life and belief than I had been able to do in previous years while I was working on my Encyclopedia of American Religions. Part of my study of the local church involved the reading of most of the published writings of Witness Lee and lengthy depositions of Neil Duddy and Brooks Alexander, a spiritual counterfeits project. The experience proved among the more painful of my Christian life. As I began to check the quotes of Witness Lee used in Duddy's book, I found that the Godmen had consistently taken sentences from Lee's writings and by placing them in a foreign context made them to say just the opposite of what Lee intended. This was done while ignoring the plain teachings and affirmations concerning the great truths of the Christian faith found throughout Lee's writings. I also took note of the ludicrous attempt to equate the local church's practice of pray reading with the use of mantras in Eastern religions. They bear no resemblance whatsoever. As I read the depositions, especially that of Duddy, I was appalled to discover the number of substantive and libelous charges made against Lee and the Godmen, which were based entirely upon the unconfirmed account of a single hostile ex-member. The mistakes and misrepresentations in the book are so frequent and so consistent that it strains credulity to suggest that the Godmen is merely the product of poor scholarship. So here you have a one researcher writing an open letter saying, at first I was very concerned about the lawsuit, but afterwards I was more concerned about the libels charges made against the local church movement and Witness Lee. That's right. And at the time I dismissed that because J. Gordon Melton has a reputation among people in my field as being a quote-unquote cult apologist. However, he went on in this book and he actually gave his own documented analysis of where they had taken Lee out of context in four different instances to prove his charge that they had deliberately taken him out of context. And the proof was there in 1985. And when I read that, I just, at the time, it was like, I responded to that the way I'm afraid a lot of people in my field are going to respond to my article today and just said, he's got to have that wrong. But I don't have time to look into this. But surely he's wrong. I mean, SCP is a very respected group and They've been very careful about everything else they publish, just as people today will say, yeah, but there's 70 scholars. They're, those are 70 respected scholars. They've been very careful about everything they've published. So this is how we perpetuate error, is we um, pass over obvious challenges to a position, documented challenges to a position that we ourselves have the means to look into and, and confirm or deny, but we just pass it by and continue to support, maybe out of a feeling of collegiality or brotherhood with other people in our field or under attack by this group because they're suing them. So, you know, let's, let's not be confused with the facts. Let's keep this feeling of camaraderie going among people in our field, our besieged field of counter-cult ministry. Well, that's not of a philosophy that could be described as truth matters. And uh, so that's why I feel right now we're at a paradigm shift in countercall community where we have got to learn from this experience and not keep repeating these kinds of behaviors if we want this form of ministry to be viable, valid, and ongoing, vital in the body of Christ.
know, he would make controversial statements that could be misinterpreted, and he would not immediately clarify his position and submit it to many qualifications because he wanted the full force of the particular thing that he was saying at the moment to sink in. So later in his teaching, he would then present the balancing views that showed that what he was teaching was well within orthodox theology. But we, in our research, did not keep reading far enough. It was a flaw in our research methodology, Hank, and it's only been really in, you know, CRI more than any other ministry that I know of in the countercult world, all the way back to the days of Walter Martin, has always believed in dialogue, believed in being open and seeking to reach out and win people to Christ and not just denounce them as heretics. And we've practiced it at many times, but nonetheless, in many cases, we would simply read a group's literature and draw conclusions without seeking to have them explain their teachings to us. And uh, we never really went to them and sought dialogue and understanding from them. And when you accepted their invitation for dialogue in 2003, which originally I was very uncomfortable with, but I went along with it because I believe in dialogue, and you asked me to. But as we actually began to enter into the dialogue, they began to explain the context of some of these teachings that we had all responded to. Now, the people that wrote this open letter, they haven't engaged in that same dialogue process. I believe that many of them who are fair-minded and good scholars would and still will as they read our material here and as they maybe even take it the next step and, and then enter into dialogue with the local church members themselves they will come to the same conclusions that we have. And what we should always do is, number one, you want to interact with the people and understand them in their own terms instead of just looking into them enough to confirm your own prejudice. If they're adamantly telling you, no, we don't believe that, you're getting it wrong, well, find out what they do believe. Talk about it in different ways. Help them to explain to you what they believe. But instead, we just kept dropping the C word on them. You know, we didn't, but others in the countercult community would call them a cult. We called them cultic and uh, aberrant. And, you know, that got them to react offensively, and it was a deteriorating situation. So instead of having the dialogue that would have helped us transcend the cultural and language barrier, instead we had a call to arms. With regard to the local church, this was almost the ultimate test of whether we would be true to our historic principle of dialogue because there was probably no group we had worse blood with and less reason to want to dialogue with. We had a, a basic animosity toward them and uh, a very sharp history of contention and really nothing to gain from it. It was only it was a test almost of our willingness to dialogue. And I participated in that to be true to that principle, but really expected nothing to come of it. And uh, was surprised to f by truth to find out that indeed these were not only brothers in Christ, but that um, you know, th in the meeting when they were professing that they believed in in orthodox doctrine, Gretchen and I were still skeptical. Hank was probably quicker to believe because he didn't have the same history with them that Gretchen and I had. So Gretchen and I went to Anaheim and spent three full days in dialogue with uh, representatives of the movement, going over their materials, reading materials they gave us, asking for clarification on this point and that point, until we finally worked it all out and saw that indeed the reason they haven't recanted these doctrines is they never taught what we thought they were teaching. We're the ones that need to recant this time. Okay, we're Christians. Let's rise to the challenge and confess that we were wrong. I have uh, gone out on a limb uh, standing with the local church movement because I do believe this is an authentic expression of New Testament Christianity. 
I do believe that you are genuine brothers in the Lord, as are your wives and uh, many other uh, people that I've met within the local church movement. I've gone out on this limb because I believe that uh, it is more important for us to not merely say that the local church movement is not a cultic movement, either from a sociological or a theological perspective, but that... This movement, which was ultimately forged in the cauldron of persecution, has something to offer to Western Christianity. One of the distinctives of the move of the Holy Spirit that you're involved in, it's not for the pastor alone to study the Word of God. It is not alone for the pastor to prophesy in the sense of encouragement, edification, exhortation, and equipping, but it is for every believer to be involved in the proclamation of the Word, in praise, and in worship. In every sense, we worship God through prayer, praise, and the proclamation of the Word. And that is for every believer. The local churches involve their membership in worship, in oneness, and in witness, in worship through prayer, praise, and the proclamation of the word. So you don't have a clergy-laity distinction in the same sense that many other denominations do. When someone comes to church, they have prepared themselves by feeding on the Word of God, immersing themselves in biblical passages, so that when they go to church, they can prophesy, not prophesy in the sense of foretelling the future, but in the 1 Corinthians 14 sense of edification and uh, strengthening other believers. So they immerse themselves in the Word so that the Holy Spirit can speak through them in the edification of other believers. And boy, you just hit something on the head. This is immersing yourself in the Word of God in a way I've never seen people do before. You know, it's a unique approach to it. They develop their own devotional practice, and it is full of content. And the Sunday morning services, they've all studied, they've all prayed, they've all been in the Word, they have a particular topic they're going to deal with on Sunday morning, and they each have a few minutes, you know, whoever is led of the Spirit, exactly like Paul describes in, in 1 Corinthians 14, they will get up, they will preach, they will proclaim, prophesy in, a, in the sense of um, exhorting by the Spirit of God, you know, believers on that subject. And it seems orchestrated by the Holy Spirit because each new person adds something meaningful to what the person before said. And you really get into that passage of Scripture in a way that just, exposi- not that expositional teaching isn't extremely valuable and shouldn't continue full force, but just that in addition to that, this particular method of approaching the Word of God is by no means Eastern meditation. It is biblical meditation, which means to chew on the cud. To, it means to really turn something over and go at it from every direction and get every little bit of nutrition out of that piece of food. Right now, you know, China is in a state of flux, and it could go in different directions, but uh, there is undeniably much greater religious freedom there, and there's undeniably a revival going on there. And what I observe, having the concerns about faithfulness to orthodoxy, faithfulness to the essentials of the gospel, and, and genuine Christian discipleship, and not just having something that calls itself Christianity and they raise their hands in worship and and they get emotional when they pray, but then they begin to preach prosperity as a sign of God's favor 
and as a guarantee of the gospel, or they begin to incorporate shamanistic pagan uh, practices into their Christianity, which you often find in, in areas in which Christianity is growing in the third world. But when we were in China, what I saw was a much more faithful uh, expression of Christianity, and I began to see that this could be the best hope for the church in the future. As the lights are going out in the West, they are starting to brighten up in the East, and you have some very dedicated disciples of Christ, dedicated, I might add, within the local church movement to Orthodox theology. They're not just into experience, experiencing Christ, and they're certainly not into just name it and claim it kind of theology at all. They understand what sacrifice is. They understand what faithfulness is, and they are aggressively bringing the gospel as much as they can within that repressive regime to the lost. And you and I saw an example of that when we attended the meeting of the church in Nanjing, And it was a two-story building that was full on both floors for the morning worship service. And then afterwards, we broke up upstairs into a multitude of small group college-age meetings. And these young people were so excited about Jesus Christ. We went around. I I was in a group of maybe 15, 16. There were probably seven or eight groups like that throughout the second floor. And you were in another one. And in my group... They went around the group and had everybody tell how long they'd been a Christian. I don't believe that one of them had been a Christian for longer than six years. And some of them had not yet become Christians, but were drawn there by the spiritual life that they were seeing in these people. And so at the end of the uh, day's worship service, which started at 8.30 a.m. and ended at 2.30 p.m., they had a baptismal service, and there were 45 young people. I counted them lined up to be baptized. And that wasn't like, well, we're, we're having our annual baptism. That was like this week's baptism. And so do we really want to be undermining or repressing something where the Spirit of God is moving this way, especially when the evidence has now finally surfaced after decades that these people are not denying essential doctrines of the Christian faith? And Elliot, uh, one of the things that has taken place publicly and is now being roundly disseminated through the Internet is an open letter by 70 Christians who are openly asking Witness Lee and his followers, Witness Lee, of course, not alive anymore, but the movement to renounce their heretical teachings. And the first question that always comes to my mind when you see a letter like this is how can 70 Christians be wrong, particularly on something that these Christians know a lot about, and that is the nature of God? How could they have missed the the import of Witness Lee's words such that they're saying these words are downright heretical? Well, you know, Hank, when you ask that question, my response is that something that I personally find even more amazing than the the idea that 70 Christians, and not just Christians, but many of these people are leading scholars, apologists, thinkers, countercult workers, uh, that they could be wrong. It's, to me, even more amazing that I could be wrong. And I was wrong, you see. And uh, so was Gretchen Passantino. Uh, our colleague, who with me worked uh, under Walter Martin here in the 1970s, and who with her husband Bob did the the original research on the local church movement, and they actually wrote the very first uh, critique of it in 1975. Uh, and you, you see, it was on our on the basis of our research primarily that the whole body of literature on the local church was built. And uh, the quotations that are that appear in this open letter, we're very familiar with because we unearthed a lot of those. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it, it, to me, 
that they would be wrong only follows since they're building their uh, conclusions on our original work, and we were wrong. And Elliot, uh, one of the things that has taken place publicly and is now being roundly disseminated through the Internet is an open letter by 70 Christians who are openly asking Witness Lee and his followers, Witness Lee, of course, not alive anymore, but the movement to renounce their heretical teachings. And the first question that always comes to my mind when you see a letter like this is how can 70 Christians be wrong, particularly on something that these Christians know a lot about, and that is the nature of God? How could they have missed the, uh, the import of Witness Lee's words such that they're saying these words are downright heretical? Well, you know, Hank, when you ask that question, my response is that it's something that I personally find even more amazing than the the idea that 70 Christians, and not just Christians, but many of these people are leading scholars, apologists, thinkers, countercult workers, uh, that they could be wrong. It's, to me, even more amazing that I could be wrong. And I was wrong, you see, and uh, so was Gretchen Passantino. Uh, our colleague, who with me worked uh, under Walter Martin here in the 1970s, and who with her husband Bob did the the original research on the local church movement, and they actually wrote the very first uh, critique of it in 1975. Uh, and you, you see, it was on our on the basis of our research primarily that the whole body of literature on the local church was built. And uh, the quotations that are that appear in this open letter, we're very familiar with because we unearthed a lot of those. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it, it, to me, that they would be wrong only follows since they're building their uh, conclusions on our original work. And we were wrong. You know, people who say, I've, I've seen the complaint appear, and it's an understandable complaint. Well, you at CRI tell us that you've researched it and it's orthodox, but are we supposed to simply take your word for it when we've got these quotes staring us in the face that Witness Lee and the local church members have made? And that's a good point, but now it's no longer the case because the basis for our conclusions are all laid out, fully documented, in this article, and you can look at it for yourself, but ultimately, you know, it just comes down to the fact that in regard to the Trinity, they actually are bringing a corrective to a problem within Western evangelicalism, and that is that we have sometimes got rather simplistic approaches to how we deal with the mystery of the Trinity, as if we can codify the entire doctrine in four simple statements. And that it's no longer a mystery that even though for two millennia, the best minds in the Christian church have struggled with this doctrine, now all of a sudden the countercult community in America uh, has, has simply nailed it. And, you know, it, it fits our little brief statements one God and three persons, or three persons in one nature, and if you deviate from that, now you're in the realm of heresy. Well, no, it's not that simple. Well, you're addressing the open letters concerns and the nature of God, and I'll tell you one thing, reading that article alone, grappling with it would do every single person listening to my voice right now a great deal of good. I benefited immensely from it. In fact, I learned from it, and so will you. But 
let's understand the context of what they're teaching. And when you get the context of what they're teaching, for example, Witness Lee says, on the one hand, the New Testament reveals that the Godhead is unique and that only God who alone has the Godhead should be worshipped. On the other hand, the New Testament reveals that we, believers in Christ, have God's life and nature and that we are becoming God in life and nature, but will never have his Godhead. Okay, and I lay out all of these different quotes in which he teaches that we do not partake in the sovereignty of God. We are not to be worshipped. And furthermore, we partake in the deity, not with respect to eternity or the ontological nature of God, but with respect to God's economy, his salvation plan here on the earth, which is a progressive manifestation of God first through the creation, then through Christ, then through the the work of the Holy Spirit, and then through the church. And ultimately, when the church is perfected, our Our lowly human natures will be conformed into the likeness of his glorious nature. He became man that we might become like him, that we might manifest God as perfectly as he does, that we might have an intimacy with the triune God that is such that we perfectly represent him. And he prayed that they might be one even as we are one. Okay, this is the kind of thing that the local church is talking about. They're talking about things that we ourselves believe in. We just don't use the same words for it. They're not talking about us becoming like God in his eternal nature, becoming objects of worship, having sovereignty, becoming omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. No, those are incommunicable attributes of God. What they're talking about is exactly what we believe, that as we are perfected in his image, we will take on his communicable attributes and we will experience an intimacy with him uh, that is perfect. Now, going to the present issue at hand with respect to the Lord's recovery or the local churches, I started out reading a statement that people oftentimes quote with respect to what the local churches say regarding this sense of we are God. I just quoted that to you. And what I wanted to follow is to say to you that what is neglected is the qualifying statements that are made within the context of the local churches. Nevertheless, we must know that we do not share God's person and cannot be worshipped by others. Only God himself has the person of God and can be worshipped by man. Not only so, but as the author makes clear elsewhere, it is a great heresy to say that we are made like God in his Godhead. And that was the statement of Witness Lee, uh, who is the primary proliferator of the Lord's recovery around the world. And he goes on to write, from eternity to eternity, he, God, remains the same in his essence, but in his economy, the triune God has changed in the sense of being processed, as such believers are infused with the life of God and thus deified through a process involving regeneration, sanctification, renewing, transformation, confirmation, and glorification. And of course, apart from a double standard... Athanasius of Alexandria, widely regarded as the greatest theologian of his time, would likewise be accused of heresy for suggesting that the Word was made man so that we might be made God. Not only so, but the Apostle Peter would be suspect for stating that we are partakers of the divine nature. Again, we're talking about a movement that was originally founded by a Watchman Nee, and then his protege, Witness Lee, helped spread this movement around the globe, literally. And in China today, they are reproducing disciple makers on a scale that is fairly 
unprecedented. When you look at this movement, many people will say, look, they call themselves the local churches. And therefore, if you go into a particular locale, if you go to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina or Los Angeles, uh, California, uh, they say there's only one church. They believe in localism. And therefore, it seems to us that they're calling themselves the only church. Is that really what they're saying? No, it's not. And I have to say that unlike most countercult researchers, on this particular point, I understood them way back in the 70s because I had read Watchman Nee's book, The Normal Christian Church Life. And I understood what, what the teaching was all about. It's just that I misunderstood how the local churches were applying Watchman Nee, and I thought they were taking him uh, in ways that they actually I now now know that they were not. In other words, I, I was believing a lot of secondhand information about their behavior and their claims that I was getting from other researchers instead of going to the source itself and, and confirming these things. But really, you know, what you have to understand here is that the underlying concern behind their teaching on localism, which is the belief that there's one church in one city, is a desire to see unity in the body of Christ and a desire to accept all believers as Christians. It's not a desire to create a point of division where they're the true church and you're not in it or to renounce you as a genuine believer. But they're simply thinking deeply about the matter and they're asking, what is the basis for unity? And Watchman Nee in his writings and Witness Lee in his came to the conclusion that the only proper basis for division among Christians is distance. In other words, in the city of Nanjing, they cannot, for practical reasons, worship with Christians in the city of Shanghai. So there have to be two different churches there because they're divided by space, you see. But any other division other than uh, denying essentials, which they would certainly agree would be a reason for division. You don't meet with people that deny Jesus Christ, that deny the gospel. But if we affirm essentials, and uh, if we're in the same locality, why are we not in fellowship? Why are we not together? And so they said, therefore, there's only one church in one city. When God looks down on a city such as Charlotte, does he go, oh, there's, there's my people, the United uh, Presbyterians, and, and the, then there's the Presbyterian Church of America, and then there's the Southern Baptists, and there's you know, the American Baptists, and, and there's the Assemblies of God. I've got so many churches in the city. No, God doesn't see our divisions, our distinctions that we have created for theological or you know, aesthetic or whatever our reasons are for creating, you know, personality reasons. In fact, Scripture defines such things as carnal. You say you are of Paul, you say you are of Apollos, are you not carnal acting like mere men? You know, it was Paul's rebuke to the Corinthians who divided over personalities. And so what they're saying is, God looks down, sees one people, and in a city there's one church. That has been misinterpreted to mean that they are claiming to be the true church. Actually, they believe all the believers in the city are members of that church, but they believe that we should meet on that basis of locality. And that's where the controversy enters. And a lot of people would say, no, there are good reasons for Presbyterians to meet because they have certain beliefs about covenant and so and, and God's sovereignty that unite them and, and that they can agree and serve God and accomplish things for. So there's different perspectives about these issues. And certainly I'm not saying that the local church uh, group has all the answers or that the denominations are wrong. It's a very complicated issue. But the fact is that they have a right to that opinion. It's not a cultic belief. It's a particular take on the basis for the local church, which we all have to come up with one position or another. They come up with a pretty biblically solid one. They can make a pretty solid biblical case for it. It's not heresy. It's not saying that you're not a Christian or you're not in the church of Jesus Christ. They fully accept you. You go into their meetings, they will serve communion to you if you confess Jesus as your Savior. They're not denying your salvation. They're not denying your Christian standing, nor are they denying that the Holy Spirit is working in your life and using you. So there's been a lot of misunderstanding about their beliefs on this subject.
This goes all the way back to 2003 when I asked Elliot Miller to join me for a meeting with representatives of Living Stream Ministry. This is a ministry which supports the local church movement founded by Watchman Nee and his protege, Witness Lee. Now, during that meeting, Elliot and I heard stirring affirmations of the very doctrines that the local churches allegedly denied. One by one, in their own words, representatives of the local churches testified to their belief in one God revealed in three persons who are eternally distinct, to the reality that human beings can never ontologically attain godhood, and to the fact that they were only the church, not the only church. What we did is we initiated a special research project. Again, it's in this edition of the Christian Research Journal. And that research was conducted not only in the United States of America, but also in China, in Taiwan, South Korea, England. And it involved careful evaluation of literally hundreds of books, of papers, of church documents, audio, video recordings, even court documents. And the result of this primary research is encapsulated in three words. The words are on the front cover of this journal. The three words are, we were wrong. In fact, I still remember Elliot Miller saying those three words, I was wrong, to a man in China who had suffered imprisonment for a total of 24 years. That just falls off our tongue. But think about it, being in prison for 24 years, not four years or 14, 24 years. And these words, therefore, were not merely uttered in a moment of emotion. No, quite frankly, these words were uttered after years of painstaking primary research. Elliot, in this edition of the Christian Research Journal, writes that the group that we're talking about here, the local church movement, is not only Christian, but in many ways an exemplary group of Christians. They're a fellowship of believers with a level of commitment to Christ, a level of discipleship that puts most Western Christian groups to shame. They've been tested by the fires of persecution and have persevered. And as a result, they have been forged into the image of Christ to an inspiring degree. Their love for Jesus Christ is compelling. Their sacrificial living, convicting. You and I experience that in China. And I want to underscore, Elliot, that the primary research that we're talking about has been conducted not only in the U.S., but in far away places throughout the world. We traveled to many cities in China. I've been to Hong Kong and to Taiwan and Shanghai and to Beijing, Fujing. I have been to London. I've been all over the world in earnestly searching out this matter. And what I have seen is exactly what you write here. Authentic New Testament Christianity in action.
You know, many years ago, the late Dr. Walter Martin, my late husband Bob, and other CRI associates did an evaluation of the teachings of the local church movement uh, following the teachings of a man named Witness Lee, who was the successor to the Chinese Christian uh, mystic Watchman Nee. And at the time, we did our evaluations for a wide variety of reasons, some of the lack on our side and some of the lack on their side. We came out with some very critical evaluations of that movement. Now, here it is 30-some years later, and having uh, sat down with you, uh, the Christian Research Journal Editor-in-Chief, Elliot Miller, and some of the leaders of this movement, we have completely reevaluated not only the materials that were available back then, but the materials that are available since then. We have spent time in dialogue and conversation with these leaders and with, you know, ordinary people in, in the group as well. And we have determined that the local church movement is well within Christian orthodoxy. They are not a cult. They are not cultic. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And although there are a number of issues on which we have differences, uh, a number of practices and understandings that we do not share, none of those are in the areas of the essential, foundational, cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and I'm not afraid to say that.